So, hello, good morning to all of you. Today, uh, we will be discussing uh, the syllabus of uh, this paper, Ethics, Integrity and Aptitude. Before uh, going into the syllabus, let me introduce myself. I am Pavan Kumar and I have been teaching uh, this ethics paper for uh, UPSC aspirants for the last uh, seven years since UPSC has uh, introduced this paper in the syllabus of uh, uh, general studies. So before looking at uh, the syllabus and uh, the contents of the syllabus and everything else, let us uh, look at uh, the reason why UPSC introduced this uh, paper in the first place. Then we, we can go to other aspects. 2013 was the year when uh, UPS, inter UPS introduced this paper. Before introducing this paper into the syllabus, so many events took place. Let us go through all of them so that uh, we will be in a better position to empathize with uh, the syllabus. It is the UPSC which conducts examination for uh, the civil services examination. Over a period of time, this examination process has undergone so many changes. Initially, there was only main examination followed by the personality test called interview. Later, uh, UPS introduced the preliminary examination. Then they introduced uh, so many other changes like uh, uh, introducing more optionals, removing some of them, so on and so forth. By the year 2000, it was found that uh, there was something wrong with uh, the examination process. Why? Because most of the people who are getting into services, it was found that have neither experience, neither the skills, nor knowledge, nor attitude to become successful civil servants. This is what we always say. The most important strength of any organization is its human resources. In case of the government of India also, it is about uh, the civil servants. If the civil servants have uh, the necessary attitude and aptitude, automatically there will be success on the part of the government in terms of uh, performing all its functions, whether it is regulatory functions like maintenance of law and order or whether it is uh, uh, developmental functions like implementing the welfare schemes. But what is required here is the necessary skills and values. What has been found by UPSC was that in 1990s, maximum number of students who were getting into the civil services were from a science background. All of them were from this science background and uh, they got into civil services because uh, by 1990s UPSC introduced mostly what we call science optionals. And these science optional students, they have a uh, 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 very good uh, skills as far as uh, this mathematics or physics or chemistry or uh, medical science are concerned and they would get very good marks in those subjects that would ultimately decide their uh, ranking and service also so then uh, that is when it was found that uh, uh, those who are getting in the services simply are not possessing what is called administrative skills these people have a very good uh, intelligence but do not have the aptitude for governance nor the attitude for governance because they are mostly from science background and they were trying to look at the things from a different perspective administration is completely different that is when UPSC realized that there is something wrong because in 1990s was a momentous decade for India in terms of uh, the changes that had taken place we have uh, this liberalization privatization globalization then we had uh, this uh, uh, implementation of the 73rd and 74th amendments, what we call it as democratic decentralization. And we also have introduced technology in governance called e-governance. And uh, we also have seen a proliferation of what we call these non-governmental organizations, NGOs. All of them combined together, what they have done is that they introduced radical reforms in governance. It was given, it was again UPSC 
that was uh, uh, the given the responsibility of recruiting the right kind of personnel to bring those changes to implement those changes and also to ensure the success of those changes so uh, the recruitment process was mostly testing them on those optionals and uh, once they got into services it was found that they did not possess the necessary skills then what did upsc do it has appointed a committee it has appointed a good number of uh, commissions and committees to suggest uh, what kind of changes that can be made in the entire system in the recruitment process yk alak committee was formed this yk alak committee was given uh, the responsibility of uh, Uh, recommending changes to the recruitment process so that uh, those who are getting into the services have the necessary attitude and aptitude why kala company has suggested that uh, please uh, introduce uh, this uh, values in administration ethics in governance test the necessary values that are necessary for them to succeed because administration is different from other uh, professions if you are a software engineer you don't require any values if you are a businessman you don't require any values but if you are an administrator you need a lot of values for you to succeed what are those values why those values are needed and how those values are important for them to succeed that is what the administrators must know that is what those who are getting into civil services also should know the recommendations were made but uh, it has taken a lot of time for upsc to see whether those uh, recommendations uh, have been successful or not they did not implement the recommendations immediately then what happened then uh, more commissions and committees were appointed second administrative reforms commission was appointed in 2009 and it also had submitted the report wherein it has again recommended the same that is let those getting into services have uh, the necessary values that Uh, must be there in them for them to succeed at the ground level test those people getting into services whether they have those values or not and then these training institutions lal bahadur shastri national academy of administration sardar vallabhai patel national police academy lal bahadur shastri national academy of administration mussoori this is where training is given to the civil servants whether it is uh, IAS officers or IPS officers training is given them and the Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel National Police Academy is where the training is given to police officers Hyderabad these institutions have made a complaint with UPSC what is the major complaint of these institutions what did they say the problem here is that the average age of people getting into services is average age is almost 29 years average age of people getting into services is 29 years so when you are getting into services at the age of 29 it becomes very difficult for these training institutions to change the attitudes and values of those people at the age of 29 means your uh, personality is fully developed there is not much that can be done by these training institutions as far as changing their uh, value systems are concerned so they have requested upsc please do something about it second thing is that the problem here is that the training programs are also not taken seriously this training is also not taken seriously by the uh, officers who are getting into the services why because this training is not a, a, is not a, the factor that would determine their further career advancement that is uh, the promotions are not decided on the basis of the training their rank and cadre are not decided on the basis of the training once the upsc comes out with the final results on the basis of those final results their service their rank their cadre everything is decided before they go to the training institutions so what is happening here is that since uh, everything is uh, decided before they go to the training institutions 
at the end of the day these uh, officers are not taking this training seriously at all it was considered uh, what you call it as a paid holiday they by these officers the officers considered training as a paid holiday the those uh, officers getting into the services were never taking this training seriously the training institution simply could not uh, change the values and attitudes of these officers according to the needs of uh, the government so what these training institutions have complained to upsc is that since we are not able to impart a proper uh, training give them right kind of values to these uh, officers you please test those values in the examination process once you test them in the examination process automatically they will take them seriously and they will learn about those values so finally on the basis of uh, the recommendations of uh, this uh, this uh, yk ala committee second administrative reforms commission and also on the basis of the recommendations of these training institutions in the year 2013 upsc made major changes to the examination process it was a momentous year as far as the civil services recruitment is concerned they made radical changes and one of the important changes that they made was introducing this ethics paper in the syllabus introducing the ethics paper what they have done they have removed one optional and uh, introduced more papers in gs earlier there were only two papers now they have included three more papers in gs and uh, one of the papers that they have introduced was this ethics paper so this is the story behind introducing the ethics paper in the upsc examination civil services examination so what is the story here let us briefly look at what is the what are the reasons the reasons are very simple those officers who are getting into the civil services ias officers ifs officers ips officers revenue service officers customs officers they simply did not have the necessary values that are needed for them to succeed for them to bring about uh, the development of the country to bring about the socio economic transformation of the country to ensure overall uh, success of the country that is the reason why it was felt that there must be changes in the examination process that would uh, ultimately help uh, the training institutions to impart uh, more values that would also help the upsc to get uh, people with the right kind of values into civil services those who have knowledge of administration those who have the values that are necessary for them to succeed as civil servants this is what upsc has done by introducing the ethics paper once you understand the reasons why this paper was introduced it is not at all difficult it would be not at all difficult for us to for us to understand the syllabus and also to learn about the syllabus the entire objective of introducing this ethics paper is to make sure that those who are getting into the civil services possess the right kind of values that are necessary for them to succeed at the highest level as we have said they are expected to bring about a socio economic transformation of the country they are expected to ensure rapid economic growth and development of the country they are expected to ensure empowerment of weaker sections of our country they are expected to bring about uh, uh, re uh, remove regional inequalities ensure balanced regional development of the country to achieve all these uh, to achieve uh, all these objectives what is required is they must possess certain values this examination will test whether they possess those values or not whether they have the ability to put the values into practice or not for example what are the values they must require they need something like honesty integrity selflessness 
empathy, service orientation, impartiality, non-partisanship, transparency, accountability, you name it, they need all those values. We have to see whether they have those values or not. As we have said earlier, when they were taught these values in the training institutions, it was not at all successful because they were getting into services at the age of 29. Very difficult to change their personalities. So let us test them whether they have those values before getting into services than giving training to them after they get into services. That is the objective of introducing this ethics paper. So proceeding further, let us look at what is the syllabus of this paper and why UPSC has included these things in the syllabus. Let us see all these things. So, so if you see here, the syllabus starts with uh, the first topic called ethics and human interface. It says essence, determinants and consequences of ethics in human actions, dimensions of ethics ethics in private and public relationships, human values, lessons from the lives and teachings of great leaders, reformers and administrators, role of family, society and educational institutions in inculcating values. That is what the first topic of the syllabus says. What uh, to understand the syllabus better, we can divide that into three parts. The first topic of the syllabus, if we see that if we see this uh, first topic of uh, the syllabus, Ethics and Human Interface, this topic basically deals with, uh, it basically deals with uh, the ethical aspects it basically deals with ethical aspects so while studying this topic we will come to know what are these ethics what are these values what are these uh, morals more importantly, why do we need these ethics, values and morals? What are the factors that determine ethics of a country, of a society? Whether the ethics are they for good or bad? Whether these ethics are universal or relative? Whether they are absolute or relative, universal or situational? We will come to know all these things. Before discussing this topic, what I can say here is that as human beings, all of us, by nature as human beings, we are neither good nor bad. That is what we say. By nature as human beings, we are neither good nor bad. Then what are we then? We are simply guided by what is called self-interest. We are only concerned about our self-interest. We are only concerned about our own benefits, our own welfare, our own satisfaction. That is the problem with human beings. We are not concerned about others. And what is the irony here? The irony here is that we are always dependent on others for our survival. We are always dependent on others for our survival. If you look at the entire human history, it is only the human beings of all the creatures that are there on this earth, of all the animals, of all the species that are there on this earth, it is only the human beings who can be called interdependent. We depend on others for our survival. And that is the reason why we should know what kind of relationship we can have with others. 
if we are always guided by self interest automatically what happens we will only be exploiting others we will be only taking things from others we will only be manipulating others then the societies will collapse that is the reason why we need ethics to define our relationship with others that is what the first topic of the syllabus says it says that ethics and human interface it talks about ethics and human interface that means what kind of norms we should follow while interacting with others while dealing with others while talking to others while having relationship with others that is what it says essence determinants and consequences of ethics in human actions that is what we said what is the consequence of our action that is if we are only guided by self interest what are the consequences if you are only guided by selfish motives what are the consequences that is what it says what are the different dimensions of ethics you talk about different types of ethics public ethics private ethics uh, virtue ethics uh, teleological ethics deontological ethics like this uh, we talk about the different dimensions of ethics this is what uh, uh, the topic says ethics in private and public relationships ethics in private and public relationships here basically as i said what we do in private is different from how we deal in public so what kind of difference is there in our private relationships as well as in public relationships our values individual values will they impact our functioning or not professional functioning or not this is what this topic normally deals with ethics in private and public relationships then uh, human values lessons from the lives and teachings of great leaders reformers and administrators here we will be talking about uh, so many uh, reformers for example in this topic what we are doing is that we will be discussing that topic with uh, along with uh, this uh, topic contributions of uh, moral and moral philosophers and thinkers from india and the world we will be discussing at least 20 25 moral and uh, political philosophers right from aristotle to mahatma gandhi from uh, vivekananda to abraham lincoln from amartya sen to jawala nehru we talk about all of them we talk about their contribution we talk about their importance we talk about how to put them into practice teachings from as you can see here uh, teachings from leaders uh, the lives and uh, uh, teachings of uh, the great leaders reformers and administrators then uh, proceeding further as you can see here we have a role of a family society and educational institutions in inculcating values what do we mean by that whenever we talk about learning ethics from who sh whom should we be learning ethics from whom should we be learning these values that is the question that is there we should be learning these values and ethics from our parents from educational institutions from society that is where we will be learning all these things we will be talking about so many things here how the family the disintegration of joint family systems ultimately has resulted in a decline in the value systems how the educational institutions which have become more commercialized which have become more exploitative has resulted in uh, again uh, again uh, declining value systems while talking about these things we make uh, some very thoughtful statements also for example what is the basic problem with our education system what we say is that the basic problem with our education system is that it teaches us 
how to be successful this education system always teaches us how to be successful it teaches us what is uh, what we should do <coughs> sorry it teaches us what should we do as far as uh, you know to become successful in life whether you are an engineer doctor lawyer accountant politician you name it it teaches us how to be successful it says that uh, clear the iit examination get into iits become an engineer and earn money clear medical examination become a doctor and become a successful doctor start your own super specialty hospital and uh, start uh, making lot of money become a study law and become a great lawyer accountant like that it teaches us how to be successful but the problem with our system is that it never tells us why should we be good that is the problem with our system that is the problem with our education system the problem with our education system is that it never tells us why we should be good it never tells us why we should help others it never tells us why we should be kind to others it never tells us why we should be having empathy towards others problems it never tells us why should we spend our life in the service of others why because in material materialistic societies like what we have now success is measured only in terms of your money your status your power your position your name your fame and your uh, overall uh, position in the society that is where the problem is and that is the problem with our education system also we simply don't have any values in our education system it never promotes values it only promotes one thing our education system promotes only one thing that is how to be successful success success and success we run after madly this is success it never tells us why we should be good it never tells us why we should be empathetic that is a problem that is what we will be discussing as part of uh, this uh, topic role of educational institutions family and uh, uh, the other things next uh, come to the next topic in our syllabus let us look at uh, the next topic in our syllabus this is attitude and foundational values for civil services integrity impartiality non partisanship objectivity dedication to public service empathy tolerance and compassion towards weaker sections so as usual we must look at the reason why this topic was included in our syllabus why this topic was included in our civil syllabus by upsc please remember whatever the topics that upsc has included in our syllabus they were included after an in depth discussion within upsc with the help of uh, the professors with the help of the administrators with the help of uh, other credible sections of society that is the reason why these topics were included after careful consideration by upsc why did they include this topic attitude and foundational values why did they include this topic we say that the basic problem with the civil services in india the most important problem with civil services in india is that our civil services suffer from what we call it as colonial attitudes our civil servants they suffer from what we call it as colonial attitudes they suffer from this colonial attitudes what is this colonial attitude they think that they are the masters and treat ordinary people as their servants that is the reason why the term civil servant as jawala nehru pointed out is a complete misnomer during the british times it was called indian civil service i c s i c s 
Yeah, well, they have called it as complete a misnomer. What is the reason why he called it as a complete misnomer? Why? Because these civil servants never behaved like servants of the people. Civil me servant means you are a servant to a master. Civil means you are a servant to the people. Civil servant means servants of the people. In reality, they always behaved like masters. That is what we said. They suffered from these colonial attitudes. So those who are getting into civil services, the young men and women who are getting into civil service should know what is expected of them. They should know why they are getting into services. They should know the foundational values of the civil services. They should know the reasons why the government is uh, putting so much of effort to recruit them to civil services. Please remember this examination is uh, one of the most difficult examinations anywhere else in the world because you are expected to know so many things history, geography, polity, economy, sciences, um, then uh, ethics, administration, international relations. You are expected to know so many things. What is the reason why the government is taking so much of uh, effort to recruit the best of the talent from the country to India to these civil services? Because of the fact that uh, they are the torch bearers of, torch bearers of uh, our uh, society. They are expected to bring about uh, this kind of uh, transformation. To bring about uh, that socio-economic transformation, they must have values. They must possess uh, all the values. And that is the reason why UPSC has uh, included this topic in our syllabus. The reason why civil services in India are a failure because of the fact that they simply did not possess the right kind of values. If you look at it, if you look at uh, uh, these things, India has uh, abundant talent. India has uh, resources. We have the resources, we have uh, the necessary resources, we have manpower, we have uh, uh, good uh, systems. In spite of having all those things, why the country is not developed? What is the reason why country remains to be a poor country? If you go by all the global indices, human development index, multidimensional poverty index, global competitive index, global transparency index, and uh, all other indices, global transparency index, in all these indices, India continues to be doing very poorly. Global hunger index. What is the reason why? It is said that India is a rich country with poor people. We are a rich country with poor people. Why? The reason is very simple. What is the reason? Our administrators simply do not have the values. They do not possess the right kind of values to ensure an honest, accountable, transparent, efficient, responsive government. They must possess those values. As we have discussed earlier, our education system never teaches them those values. Our society never teaches them those values. Our uh, 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 employment uh, situation will never teach them those values. So that is the reason why UPSC included these things in the syllabus so that those who are getting into services at least will have some kind of knowledge about uh, what is needed of them in civil services. That is the reason why the UPSC has included uh, some of the important values like integrity, impartiality, non-partisanship, objectivity, dedication to public service, empathy, tolerance, compassion towards weaker sections of society. Like this, uh, they have included all those values. Even though they have included around 7-8 values here, we will be discussing at least 25 values not one or two that are needed for civil servants. Very important. As I said that this is very important because at the end of the day, 
they are expected to bring about the changes for example you are working as a, a district collector there are floods in your district you must rescue those people who are affected by these floods you must need what is called empathy imagine the situation of those people who have been stranded in water 3 feet water 4 feet water for hours days together not getting any kind of help what you should do immediately you should go to those places rescue the people provide basic assistance to them to do all those things what is required is empathy you must feel the sufferings of other people like this we'll be talking about as i said at least 25 values that the civil servants must possess for them to be successful that is the reason why upsc has included these topics in the syllabus you need all these values you should know how these values can be put into practice you should know you know what happens when they don't have those values for example if they don't have integrity what do they do they would indulge in what is called corruption absence of financial integrity automatically results in corruption you are using the government resources you are using the government facilities for your own benefit that is what is called corruption and the civil servants if they don't possess those values automatically would become corrupt inefficient and ultimately a failure that is the reason why they must possess those values the next topic in our syllabus is this emotional intelligence the next topic in our syllabus is emotional intelligence emotional intelligence concepts and their utilities and applications in administration and governance <coughs> sorry so what is this topic and why did they include this one what we are witnessing nowadays is people have lot of iq intelligence quotient but they don't have eq emotional quotient that is the problem all these civil servants all these young people who are getting into civil services they simply do not possess the emotional intelligence that is necessary for them to be successful what are we saying here the best example you can take as i said that our education system teaches us how to be successful it teaches us how to be successful it never tells us how to face failure and that is the reason why you can see so many young people committing suicide for small small problems they commit suicide you have seen people successful actors like sushant singh rajput committing suicide you have seen students when they don't clear the board examinations committing suicide you have seen students when they don't get into good jobs committing suicide why because they lack emotional intelligence in the same manner the civil servants also lack emotional intelligence they don't know how to deal with a crowd they don't know how to deal with an unruly politician they don't know how to deal with a, a media a belligerent media they don't know how to deal with an ever vigilant non governmental organizations and civil society organizations they don't know how to deal with these unscrupulous businessmen and politicians what is required is emotional intelligence that is what they lack all those people getting into the services all of them are having excellent intelligence please make no mistake about it anyone who is getting into ias and ips all of them are extremely intelligent there is no doubt that they are very very intelligent but is it necessary yes intelligence is necessary but is it sufficient definitely not intelligence is necessary but not sufficient what is the what do they require is what we call as emotional intelligence which they simply don't possess they don't know how to face uh, challenges they don't know how to overcome challenges they don't know how to deal with adverse situations they don't know how to uh, how to uh, uh, make peace with conflicting interests that is where the problem and that is the reason why they are a failure 
that is the reason why we talk about the application of this emotional intelligence in administration and governance a very very important topic here we'll be talking about a, a very important philosopher called max weber who spoke about value neutrality and we also talk about why this value neutrality is a, a failure in civil services we also talk about what can be done these are all the things that we should be discussing as part of uh, this topic called emotional intelligence moving on further with regard to the syllabus let us look at uh, the other parts of the syllabus moving on further we have to look at this topic called public civil services values public and civil services values this topic is one we have to discuss public civil services values ethics in public administration status and problems ethical concerns and dilemmas in government and private institutions laws rules regulations conscience as sources of ethical guidance accountability and ethical governance strengthening of ethical and moral values in governance ethical issues in international relations and funding corporate governance so what does this topic talk about till now we have seen two important dimensions of our syllabus one is the philosophical dimension philosophical dimension in the form of all the moral and political philosophers right from thomas aquinas epicurus aristotle to mahatma gandhi and jawaharlal nehru all the philosophers and their philosophies then we have seen this attitude aptitude and foundational values for civil services basically we are talking about uh, uh, these uh, uh, you know we are talking about uh, these are uh, the values that are needed for them then we are talking about combining both of them we are talking about public and civil services values ethics in public administration we are applying those topics which we have learnt in civil services in fact before talking about this topic we have to discuss something else also we have to discuss uh, this topic called attitude content structure function its influence in relation with thought and behavior moral and political attitudes social influence and persuasion we have to discuss about this topic also as we have said why did upsc include this topic we said that the reason why our bureaucracy is a complete failure is because of what is called colonial attitudes of our bureaucracy how did they develop these attitudes what is the impact of this attitude on their behavior on their value system is what we will be studying as part of this topic attitude content structure function its influence and relation with thought and behavior because ultimately it is our attitude towards other people is what that determines our behavior towards other people if i have a positive attitude towards you automatically my behavior towards would you would be a friendly behavior on the other hand if i have a negative attitude towards you my behavior would be mostly again uh unfriendly behavior for example if you look at uh, the central government and the state governments if uh, the same political party is ruling at the center as well as in the states then 
the attitude of the central government towards the state government would be more positive, more constructive. On the other hand, if they are ruled by different political parties, you can immediately see that the attitude of central government would be more negative. Behavior also would be mostly negative. For example, if you happen to read the newspapers, you can see that in the Supreme Court, when the central government had submitted its affidavit in the Supreme Court regarding increasing the number of corona cases in Delhi, central government has said that it was the failure of the Delhi state government that was responsible for the spread of corona. Why? Because the Delhi state was ruled by a portion party. On the other hand, if the state is ruled by the same political party, central government would not have given that kind of affidavit. This is what we say, our attitude defining our behavior. If you like a person, you are willing to you know, excuse the person if the person commits any kind of mistakes. You are willing to, uh, you, know, uh, you are willing to take a, a lenient view of what the person has done if uh, you like that person. On the other hand, if the person is what you think as your enemy, your behavior will be completely opposite. It will always be adverse. That is why we talk about attitude and behavior. Moral attitudes and political attitudes. What are these moral attitudes and what are these political attitudes? As we say, how do we know whether a particular person is good or not? How do we know a person is good or whether a person is bad? How do we know those things? On the basis of the moral attitudes or values that the person possesses. If the person possesses what is called good moral attitudes or values, we say that he is a good person. For example, if the person has honesty, integrity, selflessness, empathy, love and affection, faithfulness, reverence towards other people, we say that that person is a good person. On the other hand, if the person is dishonest, not having any integrity, selfish, exploitative, cruel, manipulative, then you call that person a bad person. These attitudes are the ones which define our personality, moral attitudes. Then come to the political attitudes. Why did UPSC include this topic in our syllabus, political attitudes? They have included this topic in our syllabus because it is the political attitudes that define the functioning of our political system. What do we mean by that? When we vote in elections, how do we vote in elections? Do we vote in elections on the basis of uh, the performance of the political parties or on the basis of uh, factors like uh, religion, caste, region, language, gender, so on and so forth? That is what we say political attitudes. It is the political attitudes that defines uh, the functioning of uh, democracy like India. In India, unfortunately, what are the factors that determine influence uh, the electoral outcomes? It is basically religion, caste, region, language, gender, dynasty. Nowadays, it is nationalism are the factors that are, that are defining electoral outcomes. If you look at it in the recent uh, Bihar elections, the so-called social engineering, you are trying to appease to all communities, all costs. That is where the problem is. Nobody talks about development. Nobody talks about removing poverty. Nobody talks about uh, providing employment. Nobody talks about uh, uh, sustaining uh, environment. Everyone talks about only one thing. That is Hindus versus Muslims, forward caste versus backward caste, giving more reservations, giving more subsidies, giving more uh, you know, uh, incentives to the people. Why? Because people are poor, illiterate and ignorant. And they are always guided by what we call these emotional attitudes. 
that is the reason why UPS included this topic in our syllabus. It just wants you to understand how our political system functions. It wants you to analyze what are the factors that ultimately determine, determine the functioning of our electoral systems. It wants you to understand, analyze what kind of relationship is there between the citizens and the state. It wants you to analyze what kind of culture is there in the functioning of political parties. If you look at the functioning of our political parties, all of them are, most of them are dynastic political parties. If they are ruled by very few families for ages together, dynastic. There is no scope for people from outside the family to reach top level positions. That is where the problem is. That is where the issue is. So that is the reason why that is the reason why we must know about the political attitudes so that tomorrow when you become an administrator, you must be in a position to change the political attitudes of the country for better. So that people vote in elections on the basis of the performance of uh, the political parties, not on the basis of caste or religion or any other considerations. Social influence and persuasion. As we have said, as a civil servant, you must have that kind of emotional intelligence wherein you will be in a position to you will be in a position to bring about the socio-economic transformation. Whenever whenever you are bringing about the socio-economic transformation, there will always be a lot of uh, struggle, fight, because the forward sections of society, the rich and powerful sections of society, always put a lot of obstacles in your functioning. They will make sure that you will never become successful. Why? Because any kind of changes in the power equations would always be disadvantageous to those sections of society. So you must have the skills of persuasion, telling them that what you are doing is for the overall benefit of the country, overall development of the country. For example, if you look at our Prime Minister, he has excellent communication skills. He can persuade people to accept uh, some of the radical programs of the government. For example, Take the case of Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, SBA. This Swachh Bharat Abhiyan was successful mostly because of the skills of our Prime Minister, who was uh, you know, promoting this program everywhere, who was uh, encouraging the people to actively participate in this program uh, uh, and uh, also rewarding those people who are actively participating in it by appointing uh, ambassadors and also through various other incentives. These social skills, social influence and persuasion are the important uh, uh, qualities that a civil servant must possess to, so that he would be able to be become successful in his uh, overall career. That is the reason why these topics were included in our syllabus. Proceeding further, let us look at other parts of our syllabus. Let us see what are the other topics of our syllabus. So this is a topic, public services, values and ethics in public administration. What you must remember is that the last two topics in our syllabus require in-depth knowledge of the subject called public administration. You must have theoretical conceptual knowledge of this subject public administration. Nowadays, if you look at the questions asked by UPSC in our ethics paper, Last year, almost all the questions that were asked in the ethics paper were the questions that were repeatedly asked in the public administration optional. The case studies were directly picked up from public administration optional. That is the reason why what is required is you need in-depth knowledge of public administration. Public and civil services values and ethics in public administration. So you have to discuss why 
एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर्स मस्ट हैव वैल्यूज यू हैव टू डिस्कस वाई दे मस्ट प्रोसेस एथिक्स एंड वॉट कैन ऑफ वैल्यूज दे मस्ट प्रोसेस वॉट हैपन्स विथ एबसेंस ऑफ दो वैल्यूज वॉट इज द सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ दीज वैल्यूज इन एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन स्टेटस एंड प्रॉब्लम्स वॉट आर द प्रॉब्लम्स वॉट इज द स्टेटस ऑफ एथिक्स इन पब्लिक एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन एथिकल कंसर्न एंड डायलमास इन गवर्नमेंट एंड प्राइवेट इंस्टीट्यूशन the basic problem is that whenever you are working within the government you always face what is called ethical dilemmas for example the minister has asked you to, you to sign a file and you know that it is full of corruption it is full of corruption if you are signing the file means you are helping the minister to indulge in corruption if you don't sign the file it means that the minister can suspend you for what is called insubordination for violating civil services conduct rules and regulations if you sign it it is completely unconstitutional unethical immoral illegal if you don't sign it you will be punished what should you do you are caught between what is called devil and deep sea if you move forward the devil will eat you if you go backward you will be jumping into the deep sea either way you will be dead what you should do that is what is called the ethical dilemmas that you face in government and institutions laws rules regulations and conscience as sources of ethical governance so how do we know about what is good and what is not in the government on the basis of the laws rules and regulations formed by the governments ultimately the most important source of uh, uh, values is our own conscience we can stand in front of the mirror and ask ourselves what we are doing is it right or not is it moral or not is it ethical or not we can find answers very easily we don't have to really look into the rules regulations and all those things at the end of the day our own conscience is the ultimate source of our own value system we can deceive the entire world but we cannot deceive our own self when you stand in front of mirror and ask those questions whether you have the ability courage to stand up and answer them is a what called what is called the conscience people with very clear conscience are the ones who can sleep very peacefully in the night on the other hand those who indulge in manipulation exploitation deception corruption are the ones who will never have any kind of peace of mind ultimately it is the human conscience which is the most important source of ethics accountability and ethical governance as we said the present civil services in india are nothing but the continuation of the colonial past britishers have introduced the civil services and they deliberately made sure that absolutely there are no accountability mechanisms within the civil services that is the reason why our civil servants are inefficient and corrupt because there are no accountability mechanisms how to ensure accountability how to improve their efficiency is what we are going to discuss strengthening of ethical and moral values in governance what can be done to make them more honest more committed more integrity selfless and empathy all those all those values then we will go ahead and we will discuss about ethics in international relations and funding at the global level if you look at the international relations are mostly guided influenced determined by self interest when america has withdrawn itself from the kyoto protocol and paris summit when america has threatened to withdraw it withdraw itself from other multilateral institutions and agreements it was purely guided by what is called self interest that is the reason why we will talk about what are the ethical issues in international relations and funding 
and how they should be carried out and finally we will be talking about corporate governance so here we are talking about three important systems here one is government second one is international relations third one is industry private sector we are talking about these three important institutions what happens sir? private sector is always guided by profits and it always results in massive levels of corruption this is what we call it as a crony capitalism crony capitalism wherein these big businessmen join hands with the capitalist class big businessmen they join hands with the political class as well as the civil servants to exploit the resources of the country as someone has pointed out all of us know Mukesh Ambani is the richest person in India he is also the fifth richest individual in the world richest person in the world so the question that they have asked is very pertinent here what did Mukesh Ambani do to become the richest person in India and the fifth richest person in the world. Did Reliance Industries Limited come out with any innovations? Did they come out with any discoveries? If you look at it, Microsoft, Bill Gates. Bill Gates had come out with uh, this software computer revolution, Microsoft, MS-DOS, Windows operating systems because of which he became, he had become over a period of time the richest person in the world. If you look at uh, Max Zuckerberg, he was uh, also one of the richest person in the world because of uh, what he had come out with called Facebook. If you look at uh, Apple, if you look at Amazon, all of them had come out with brilliant ideas which ultimately helped them to become richest people. What did Mukesh Ambani do? That is the question that is being asked. Did Reliance Industries Limited come out with any earth shattering innovations or discoveries? Nothing. Then how did he become the richest person? That is where we talk about crony capitalism. That is where we talk about uh, what is called corporate governance. We will be discussing all these issues in a very extensive, in-depth manner. Then come to the last topic in our syllabus. Let us come to the last topic in our syllabus. This is probity in governance. It says probity in governance, concepts of public service, philosophical basis of governance and probity, information sharing and transparency in governance. Right to information, code of ethics, code of conduct, citizen charters, work culture, quality of service delivery mechanisms, utilization of public funds and challenges of corruption. Again, as I said, we have to look at why UPSC has included these topics in syllabus. Once we understand the reasons behind the inclusion of these topics in syllabus, it becomes very easy for us to empathize with the syllabus and also for us to come out with a very good understanding of these topics why we have included this topic in syllabus because if you go by the global indices like a global transparency index even very recently if you happen to read newspapers few days back around three four days back we had a front page news item in uh, times of india what does this news item says it says that India still is one of the most corrupt countries in the world, especially in Asia. They had carried out a survey and it says that India is still one of the most corrupt countries in Asia. Why? Why? Because complete absence of probity in governance. Honesty is not there among the public officials. Integrity is completely absent among public officials. 
they simply cannot understand the concept of what is called public service they never understand the fact that they are there to serve the people not to manipulate them not to exploit them not to cheat them they don't understand that is the reason why we talk about philosophical basis of governance and probity here we talk about so many philosophers right from kautilya to mahatma gandhi what all those philosophers have said and uh, regarding governance and we will also see whether those philosophies have been have been part of our governance or not first we will understand the theoretical aspects then we will try to link them to what is happening at the ground level information sharing and transparency in governance as we say that wherever there is transparency there is not scope for any kind of corruption or opposite of it wherever there is secrecy there is always a lot of scope for corruption there is lot of scope for misuse and abuse of power there is lot of scope for nepotism favoritism and ultimately corruption misuse of power that is the reason why what we require is transparency in governance we need complete transparency in governance how to ensure this transparency in governance with the help of a right to information this is one one instrument in the hands of the people to make administration accountable for their performance when people come to know about uh, what is happening within the government they always demand more participation in governance they always demand more accountability in governance that is the reason why right information is very very important then the code of conduct and code of ethics we we'll talk about how to ensure probity in governance with the help of this code of conduct and code of ethics with the help of code of conduct and code of ethics then how to ensure people participation in governance with the help of citizen charters we'll be discussing how these citizen ch charters help us to ensure participation of people in governance why those citizen charters have been a failure why the citizen charters have not resulted in a real participation of our stakeholders in governance and what can be done what can be done we have to change the work culture of our country our bureaucracy colonial attitudes they think that they are the masters and treat ordinary people as servants that is the reason why all these reforms citizen charters rti e governance rights based approach to development all of them have been a failure we must change the work culture their attitudes their aptitudes their behavior then we must improve the quality of service delivery mechanisms as i said that maximum amount of corruption can be seen in implementation of these developmental and welfare schemes we must improve the quality of service delivery mechanisms one of the most notable achievements of the present government the present bjp government in the last 6 years is they have drastically improved the quality of service delivery mechanisms with the help of uh, technology e governance that is the most uh, notable success of the present government next utilization of public funds what you see here is lot of uh, diversion of public funds lot of corruption lot of bribery that is the reason why we will talk about all those things ultimately the challenges of corruption you require an in depth knowledge of the functioning of indian society from different dimensions from political dimension from economic dimension from administrative dimension from cultural dimension once you understand the functioning of our society from these different dimensions it is very easy to understand why we have so much of corruption in our country once we know the reasons for corruption it is very very easy for us to again to to what is called find out uh, the solutions for corruption also that is where the basic problem is absence of values in administrators is the most important reason why there is so much of corruption in our country this corruption is there it is a part of our day to day life when you cross a red light and the police person will come says that he will issue chalan and you have to pay 2000 rupees and he will say that give me 500 rupees and you don't mind giving that money 
because if you are paying the chalan it means 2000 rupees if you give 500 rupees you know you will be saving 1500 rupees that is where the problem is that is where we have so much of corruption you go to a government office to get a certificate caste certificate then the clerk demands 500 rupees he say that if you give me 500 rupees tomorrow you can come and collect the certificate otherwise you have to wait for one month what do you do you will give the money that is the reason why we have so much of corruption so this is what the entire syllabus of ethics paper this is the syllabus basically as i said what we can do is that we can divide this syllabus into three parts what uh, you know we can divide this syllabus into uh, three parts यहाँ पर व्हाइट बोर्ड चाहिए व्हाइट बोर्ड हाँ इसको कैसे करना है ओके थैंक यू वी कैन डिवाइड दिस सिलेबस इनटू थ्री पार्ट्स व्हाट आर दे first one is the philosophical dimension second one is the psychological dimension the third one is administrative dimension in the philosophical dimension we have the first topic and the fourth topic psychological dimension second and fifth topic and the remaining two topics are from administrative dimensions we can divide our syllabus into these three dimensions why because upsc when they framed the syllabus they just wanted to know from you what kind of attitude you have towards life what kind of attitude you have towards people society that is the reason why philosophical dimension they will ask basic questions like as part of philosophical dimension what is happiness most of us don't know the meaning of the word happiness also we don't know what is real happiness they will ask those questions from psychological dimension they will ask us why young people are not entering into politics why these young people are not entering into politics why our political attitudes are mostly decided by these uh, uh, what is called emotions and sentiments from administrative dimension they will ask so many questions about why there is so much of corruption why there is so much of corruption why there is no accountability why we don't have what is called corporate governance they will ask all these kinds of questions just they wanted to know from you whether you have understood the functioning of our society our polity our administration our culture our economy not only that whether you have the ability to put them into practice also they just wanted to know all those things that is the reason why they have framed the syllabus so as uh, we have mentioned in the beginning itself in 2013 upsc included this paper in the syllabus and it has 250 marks it is divided into two sections one is the questions related to what is called the theory part second one is what they called it as a case studies what is this case studies and why this was included this is what we study in public administration 
we say that uh, administration is both an art as well as a science what is the basic difference between an art and a science a science can be learnt can be taught in a classroom through verifiable methods i can teach you physics and i can make you a great physicist i can teach you uh, medicine i can make you a very good doctor i can teach you engineering i can make you a very good engineer but the problem with art is uh, that it has to come naturally i can teach you how to sing for a long period of time but can i make you a great singer like mohammed rafi or uh, lata mangeshkar obviously not it has to come within you that kind of singing for example you have so many cricket academies but there can only be one sachin tendulkar that is what we say art that is what we say you know the artistic abilities when we talk about administration as we have said that administration is also an art because tomorrow you become a collector tomorrow you become a superintendent of police you will be facing so many situations and nobody will be there to teach you how to deal with those situations nobody will be there to teach you what should be done in those situations suddenly in front of your house you are a district collector in front of your house 5000 people have gathered you don't know how to deal with them nobody will teach you these things in your training institutions nobody will teach you these things in your uh, uh, classes you have to deal with them how to deal with them is what part of this case studies this case studies will test your administrative abilities they test your values they test whether you have the presence of mind to come out with the solution to the problem that is there in front of you they test whether you have the ability to put the theory that you have learnt into practice or not this is the objective of case studies that is the reason why this 250 marks ethics paper is divided into the theory part and the case studies you have around 125 marks here and around 125 marks here for both theory as well as the case studies this is the paper and uh, if you happen to see from 2013 onwards it is this ethics paper that is ultimately deciding uh, the service and rank of the people rank and service of the people if you are getting very good marks in ethics paper automatically you will be there in top services this year that is 2020 also if you happen to see the results some of our students have got excellent marks in ethics paper for example the top ranker pradeep singh this year topper he got more than 160 155 marks in ethics paper 160 marks in ethics paper other students they got more than 155 marks in ethics paper so that is the reason why you must make sure that you are very good with your ethics paper over the next uh, say around 40 45 days or so we will try to do all these things in a very extensive manner and the only good thing about this ethics paper is that it is very very highly interesting the next question that we are asking here is uh, what is the study material for this paper what is the study material yeah uh plus okay acha okay right that's right okay okay na so what is the study material for this paper we will be giving you study material i will be giving you study material that will be there but beyond that i expect you to read some other things like uh, second administrative reforms commission has submitted a report called ethics in governance this is a, something like a bible for the students ethics in governance they must go through the entire report what upsc has done they have taken this report and converted that into our syllabus of ethics paper and apart from this 
you can read mahatma gandhi's autobiography my experiments with the truth and some other books also this is what i call the basic study material for this paper apart from this you must be going through current events on a daily basis and find out what are the events related to ethics this is what you will be doing as part of a ethics paper very simple and what i can assure you is that our classes around 40 classes we require our classes will more than cover the entire syllabus they will be more than sufficient for you to answer all the questions whether it is section a or case studies and the classes will be mostly interactive in nature i will be asking a lot of questions and you will be giving me answers also on the basis of that we will be proceeding with our syllabus thank you very much best of luck